This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description. A practical prayer is a prayer that works. These discussions between Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence dive into the details of how it works and how to work it. Reverend Bill is a New Thought minister and the author of Practical Prayer for Real Results. Your new life begins with a new thought. Carol Lawrence is on a spiritual quest, finding the New Thought teaching after decades on the pulpit in three different traditional denominations. I've got some questions. Together, they're exploring the philosophy and activities that come together from many of the world's religions to create the practical spirituality that is New Thought. Welcome to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol Lawrence here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. And we have a wonderful opportunity today to talk about, uh, you're, you're currently fascinated with uh, my attendance at the Parliament of the World Religions a week or so back, and want to talk about the thread between all religions, which I think is awesome. Yes. And when you do that, I want you to, at some point, you know, and I'm sure we will, Put some emphasis on the prayers, that, that thread that goes through the all religions. You know, the prayer. Yeah. 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 And, well, um, yeah. When I was having conversations with people of, you know, different denominations, you know, the Muslim and the Baha'i and the Latter-day Saints and the Sikhs and the pagans, I would, they, they would very politely ask what my spiritual tradition is. And when I said new thought, as often as not, they got to say, well, what's that? So I got to explain new thought. And I spent the week in Chicago fine-tuning my elevator pitch on what is new thought. And I describe it as the greatest hits of all the world's religions. If you take the best of all the religions and combine it together, then you wind up with new thought. And the idea is to love like Jesus and meditate like Buddha and pray like Muhammad and believe like Abraham. And Mm -hmm. when if that's the starting point, then, you know, there's a lot of potential there and not rule out anybody's, you know, and then Mm -hmm. go in a little deeper and talk about the the prayer practice that we use is the same one that's in all the religions. You find the Mm -hmm. really the most effective prayers in all the religions and you get somebody like Ernest Holmes to go through and say, well, what do they all have in common? What's the formula for the ones that are really working Mm -hmm. well? And then the teaching is do that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> use that formula because it's likely to make a really effective prayer. And you mm-hmm. can be as effective as the Lord's Prayer or the Shema or the Fatiha or whatever. There's the possibility for the mm-hmm. prayers to be as effective as any prayer can possibly be. And the interesting thing at the Parliament is that when you get into a conversation with somebody about, well, what's what's your tradition? What's What's your spiritual practice? What's your religion? There are two ways for the person who asks the question to be engaged. One is to be listening to the answer to try and have an understanding of the different framework and model and perspectives that the person they're talking to is. And the other one is waiting until the first person stops talking so they can convince them that their way is better. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there were some of them there. Uh, not a lot, because the people who go to the Parliament of the World Religions are actually interested in other religions besides just their own. But there are a fair number of them. And in one of the panels, uh, Michael Beckwith um, was talking about um, uh, believers, and he was talking about embodiment. And this is how we move together as part of that global ethic. And he said a believer who hasn't embodied their belief becomes a radical, trying to get others to accept their beliefs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if I'm owning my own stuff... I can talk to other people about it for, well, let's see, we're at 118 episodes now. and I can keep going. (laughs) And if somebody is, I don't need somebody else to agree with me. I'm very confident in what it is that I'm talking about, and I'm happy to invite other people in. That's a large part of my mission. But if somebody's got a spiritual practice that's working for them, God bless them. Go to it. Yeah, but that's that's a big thing, you know, I mean, I'm sure we can talk about the ego and how that's all mixed in and has, and I always say that you've got to put the ego under control or put a leash on it 
Um, you're not going to get rid of it, but to at least put a, a leash on him long enough to be able to have a, a in some intelligent discourse about religion. And um, that's one of the things that I do kind of feel bad about not going or being able to go to those things, because I want to be in conversation with people that aren't angry with other people because they don't believe the same way. It just, right. you know, it's it's happenstance. We're born, most of us are born into a certain faith tradition. We don't make a choice. Um, sometimes we make a choice later, but for the most part, people are born into it. Or you're born into a certain part of the world where that particular faith belief is. And I'm not to, not to be flippant and say it's like just coincidental, but when you find out that there are other people that are in other faith traditions and got there by the same way you got into yours, like birth, like geography, you know, that kind of thing, how do you get like nasty and angry because and say mine is the best and mine is the only? That one just tripped me up quite a lot. Yeah. And so I yes. found that uh, I had less and less to talk about in the faith tradition that I was in because it was just too many contradictions in terms of being ugly uh, with other people because of their beliefs. And it just like so happened. And the, and the funny part is, you know, my mother was Baptist turned Pentecostal. My father was uh, a diehard AME. So I was born into a, a you know, like a pot of stew. <laughs> <laughs> well, a mixed, wonderful pot of stew. Household. Yeah, so where does that leave me? You know, who, who do I argue for? And yeah, it, I don't go down that road, but it seems to be the same thing. So I'm really fascinated and delighted to hear stories about how people were able to talk to each other without, you know, getting ready to beat each other up. And yeah, all well, that. and that's, you know, that's what Beckwith was saying is, you know, if we're if we're not comfortable in where we are, if we haven't embodied where we are, then we're going to want to like make other people believe the way that we believe because making them agree with us makes us right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which you know, it'd, it'd be nice if everybody agreed with me. But suppose you're like all the way wrong. Well, <laughs> then what? It just means like, you know, then we'll it's both like an, be all an the way argument. Wrong. It's like a big argument that you're having with somebody and they are out, they're loud talking to you. And I always would kind of smile at that because you're, you're loud, right? It just, and if you're wrong, then you're loud and wrong. So, so who wins the argument isn't based on who can, you know, win the argument. There, there is no win here, I don't think. The, the only win is that we shake hands or embrace or I understand you and you understand me and we want listen, we want to make sure we mark our calendars for our next meeting so we can fill in all, all the things that we didn't understand this time, but we're not mad. Mm -hmm. We're not mad. You reminded me of a story my uh, my brother tells. He and my nephew, when my nephew was a teenager, were having a disagreement about something. And my brother starts raising his voice and he start, and he's yelling and he's screaming and his son finally says, Dad, I can hear you. I just don't agree with you. <laughs> it's like what do you say to that yeah yeah oh yeah, well but it, and it's yeah go ahead the willingness to hear each other is the part that's the most important and there's a thing that they uh that they did at the um uh at the parliament which is a global ethic and they've been working on this for the last 30 years which was the the, the, the resumption of the modern parliament of the world religions. And uh, they got it to the point where it's on a t-shirt and it's uh, respect for life, economic justice, truth and compassion, women's rights and care for the earth. And the fact that they can take their 16 page global ethic summary and put it on the back of a t-shirt is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody can agree with those things that those things are important. A lot of people disagree with how we're going about doing them and what that means inside of my particular family or faith tradition or country. So, but those are all great things to aspire to. You know, economic justice, truth and compassion, women's rights, care for the earth, respect for life. It's, there's, there's nothing bad in there. Mm -hmm. uh, we take a term like empathy and compassion. And who's not in favor of empathy and compassion? 
Everybody's in favor of empathy and compassion, except when you shorthand it as woke, you can then fight with it. <laughs> <laughs> shorthand it as woke. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that what woke means? Okay. It means that, that as I'm doing something, I want to consider how it's going to land on other people, especially the people who are disadvantaged, the people who have been at the bottom of a power differential before. And is it more convenient if I'm at the top of the power differential to not have to pay attention to who's getting crushed under me? Of course. Of course it is. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not, that's not empathy and compassion. It, that's it's my not. bird in your it's, china shop. Yeah. And it's like, what's in it for me? I mean, what is in it for me to give up my position of power and make room for you? What's in it for me? Uh, nothing economic for the most part, <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of humanity and our relationship with everything is in it for you. But our values have to be readjusted or examined and readjusted because, I mean, we're, we're just so far away from this center that you're talking about, those things that are on the t-shirt finding oh, yeah. the way back is is tough you know just i'm not sure i'm it's possible it's just going to take a minute mm -hmm. you know because there's a lot of fear of loss what am i going to lose if i do it this way if i lose the argument you know well you lose the argument you don't lose anything else right I had a friend who was a, uh, a New Thought minister, and he, uh, at the time he had a day job, so he was working in sales for a chemical company. So he did a lot of driving around on behalf of the chemical company, and he was also teaching classes for a church in New York and another one in Princeton and another one in Baltimore. So he was driving around all the time, sharing this teaching, shining the light, and he was really good at it. And when he retired uh, from the, the chemical job, uh, they had a big send-off for him, and I was talking to him after that. I said, wouldn't it be interesting if you find out that the impact that you had at this time was not nearly so much about the teaching that you did as the amount of gas you burned? <laughs> uh, what did he say? Because we're all, we're all he's, he understood. We're all doing our best. Mm -hmm. We're all doing what we're, what we're guided to do. And it's, 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 always a, it's always balance. It's like, what am I going to... What am I going to offer up here? What am I looking for? What do I want to contribute? What do I want to have happen? And to me, it's the same thing that happens at the Parliament of the World Religions when 7,000 people get together. And that was their number. I think it might have been less, but they said 7,000 people um, through there. If you, if you get together with somebody who's of a different background or faith and you try and argue with them to convince them that you're right or that you've got something going on or even that you've got a good point, you know, they don't need to give theirs up, but to agree and support you. That brings a lot of tension and energy in. Whereas if we approach the same thing with curiosity, let me let me understand more about you and how you're going to get to those five things that are on the t-shirt and what you are doing in your day-to-day -day life and in your practice that gets you closer to the infinite and gets you more fully on the path that you are desiring to be on. Because sometimes they're on a great path and it's wonderful to hear their story. You know, a vegetarian lunch every day that I was there served by the Sikhs for free, uh, which was an impressive operation because it was two or 3,000 meals a day that they were serving for free. But also the reminder that it's vegetarian, which has much less impact on the global ecosystem than a meat-based uh, diet does. And they weren't, they weren't pontificating about it. They were just serving vegetarian food. You know, there were a lot of people who were discussing that it takes 16 pounds of grain to make a pound of meat. And is it possible that when I'm eating, you know, hamburgers or steaks with my family, that that means that there's 15 families that are going hungry? Mm. Not exactly. It's, there's a distribution problem that's going on now, but that's something to, to, to think about. You grow a pound of beef, it takes 75 times as much land as a pound of tofu. Now, I'm not a huge fan of tofu, but it's an interesting point. You know, similar things with water and energy and methane and, 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 and. Does that mean we all need to be vegetarians and never eat meat again? Don't think so. That's a heavy lift. But can we be sensitive and compassionate and understand, well, there might be a good vegetarian choice that won't even feel like I'm giving anything up. Let me listen. Let me be curious. Let me, 
have some empathy for people who are going through something different and see if there's a call in there for me to change something. Yeah, but then you hit it right on the head at the end of your comments. You said, if there's a call for me to change something, what am I, if I listen to you and you make sense, I might have to change. Oh, you know, perish the thought. That, <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. You know, I think it's fundamentally, I think you have to locate yourself in the universe. I'm about like not even this much, mm -hmm. you know, in the universe. And the universe is everything. So my opinion, while it's important to me, is not and has no impact on evolution or the how the planets rotate or, or anything. It's mine. It's important to me. And if I look at it like that, I don't feel so threatened, you know, because you have yours, I have mine, and I can listen to you, you know. And like, I got this thing about learning stuff, you know that. Mm -hmm. So I'll listen to you. And if yours sounds better than mine, I'll run it through my gear a couple times. I'm cool with changing. I really am. Mm -hmm. If it sounds better. If it doesn't, I'll just hold on to it and see if it makes sense down the road. Right. But it doesn't or change. Wait, wait until I'm out of the room and then make fun of me. I can't believe he believes this. Nah, don't do that. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> you can't. Because it's, so it it's so much to know. Do you know? Um, and then here's my thing. Thing about the ocean. You know, I love the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I look at the ocean as infinite intelligence. Now, and of course, understanding that as far as my eye can see is nothing compared to the oceans that are on this planet. But that's the big for me. And um, there's so much in there to know. I only know a little bit and you know a lot and another person knows a lot. <laughs> and so I get to know a little bit more. You know, it's, it's just not that big a deal to me to be right. I, I like to make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do like to, things that make sense. And if it doesn't, I may hold it to the side a minute. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be my way. Yeah. Well, even if you're yes. just asking good questions to allow more light to come in so that people who have been on the path that you've been on can understand what's going on for somebody who's been on a different path in a different way. That's There's a gift there. There's magic there. And, you know, here's a biggie for me. How's that working out for you? It's not working, but you won't change it? <laughs> okay. Right. Got it. <laughs> right. That's the definition of insanity. Let's take a break. And then uh, when we resume, I want to talk about polishing your heart. Is Reverend Bill letting you know that the Practical Prayer for Real Results class is now available on demand. That's right. You can take it at your own pace anytime you want. All of the information is at bethelight.com. That's b-the-light.com. You know where to find that stuff. The class is five lessons broken down into 18 modules, and you can take them at whatever pace is comfortable for you. As you work through the process, it starts out with the theory, goes into the practice. There are experiential activities and exercises. And at the end of the program, you will wind up with an understanding of how practical prayer works and a practical prayer for yourself that will work to create transformation in your life. And as you know, it works for everything. Take a look at the class online at bethelight.com. There's a sample lesson so you can see how the class is going to work for you and then dive in. The great news is it's on sale now. You can register and save $20 off of the regular price. I'm looking forward to seeing you in class. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni, and you we're said talking we're going about, to talk about. Yeah, we're talking about different religions. Uh, the thread between all religions is, uh, as I came to understand it, even just a little bit better at the Parliament of World Religions. And I was going to talk about polishing your heart, because I, in my shorthand explanation of New Thought, and when I say love like Jesus, meditate like Buddha, pray like Muhammad, and believe like Abraham or Moses. I mean, the people who like go in with nothing and like get to believe something brand new, uh, pretty impressive. So one of the things that I noticed about the Parliament of the World Religions is that the people who were doing presentations just love to talk. They want to take everything that's in their head, every, everything that they know, and share it with the audience that's there. 
So when there was a keynote presentation, there was somebody on the stage with a PowerPoint spitting out a whole bunch of ideas. When there was a panel, there were a whole bunch of people, and they all took turns doing that, and maybe there was time for questions and answers at the end. When there was a workshop, they would say that they're going to do something interactive, and then they would spend the entire time <laughs> talking about their stuff because they wanted to make sure to cover everything. So I went to a workshop on a Muslim prayer practice, and because it's this is serious, you know, the 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 chime the bell rings in the tower first thing in the morning, and everybody gets up. That's the call to prayer, and you do your first prayer. And then there's you know four more times that it happens every day. And the woman who was doing the workshop, which wound up being much more of a presentation than an interactive workshop, because we did not do a ritual hand or foot washing, and we didn't roll out any mats or bow down in any particular direction. Um, we heard about it from her perspective and what she had going on. And her commitment was delightful. And she told the story about when she was a young adult, she didn't have a practice and she decided that she wanted to get back into doing her practice. And she followed her willingness and her resistance. You know, she decided I, I, I want to do you know, the prayers every day. And the first day she overslept. <laughs> <laughs> right through the, the first thing in the morning call to prayer. And the second day, she did the same thing. She was up when she heard it, but she just said, I don't want to. And she went back to sleep. And she did a prayer. She set the intention that if this is my practice to do, then I'm going to be available to it. And the next morning, 15 minutes before the call to prayer, she was wide awake. There was no chance for her to go back mm. to sleep. It's like, okay, thank you, God. I, this is mine to do. And she went <laughs> and did that. And has been doing it richly, ever since. And she's the one who said that her prayer practice was like polishing her heart five times a day. And I love that idea to be able to do that individually, to be able to do that in community, to have a group that's all doing prayer at the same time and all doing the same sorts of prayer at the same time is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Where two or more are gathered in my name, there's great power. And when there's a whole community that's doing the same thing, there is great power. So being able to tap into that is is wonderful. It is wonderful. Um, I didn't go to any more um, sessions to have somebody talk at me for an hour uh, about <laughs> what their prayer practice was. I did have the opportunity while I was wandering around the uh, the parliament, and uh, I was in the exhibit booths for New Thought. There are ten organizations that were all kind of together, and I got some conversation time with people who were just wandering up, saying, "Well, what is New Thought?" And I got to give them the elevator speech and talk about Ralph Waldo Emerson. And it was amazing how well informed and um, knowledgeable these people were. This young woman came up and she introduced and described herself as a pagan. And so we got into a conversation of who, what New Thought was about. And she thought, well, that's a great idea. You know, where did, where did this all start? So I started talking about Ralph Waldo Emerson and she's an Emerson fan. So she knew exactly what I was talking about, and we had a context, and it was a great conversation with a pagan. And who, you know, you don't necessarily expect that. Another technique where I was staying in a hotel that was attached to the, the, the convention center. So I got on the elevator in the hotel because I'm going to go down and then walk a half a mile to the exhibit halls. <laughs> if there was somebody in the elevator with me who had their their parliament credential on. I just struck up a conversation with them because I knew, well, we got 25 minutes of walking. <laughs> <laughs> and it was wonderful. I had a great conversation with a Baha'i. And that's one of the religions that I don't know that much about. So it was wonderful to talk to somebody who's, who's in the tradition and mm -hmm. understands the difference between what the religion says up at the top and the way that she's living it in her real world and honoring the traditions, but not necessarily agreeing with everything. It's like talking to a Catholic, you know, the Catholic church has some pretty serious rules about everything, but mm -hmm. there are also a lot of Catholics who are able to be devout Catholics and love what they're doing and live by the teaching and the philosophy and the doctrine and not follow all the rules. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to the, the, the free lunch served by the Sikhs on the last day, and I sat down next to a guy, and I said, well, what tradition are you with? He says, the Roman Catholic Church. And I said, oh, the one true religion. I've heard of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Did he laugh? 
He did. Did he? Oh, yeah. Okay. A great sense of humor. Well, and this was the Catholic guy who went to the Parliament of the World Religions. So he's not pretending that there's one true religion mm-hmm. and nothing else exists. He was all about finding okay, gotcha. out how to reach out and connect. I mean, that's actually his job. He's, you know, he's, mm-hmm. he's based in New York City. And his job is to be uh, involved in the cross-connection between the different religions. And he came up with a brilliant and not particularly surprising idea. It was a pith- an epiphany for him. He says, I think we got to do it through the mystics. Because the mystics in every tradition are all saying the same thing. It's yeah. the people who build religions out of them that have different ideas. To mm-hmm. which I thought... Amen, brother. And it's, this is a great time for the Catholics to notice that. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, you were, when you were talking about uh, meeting people and, and how the conversations would flow, the one thing that John, oh, you mentioned the person that was pagan and you mentioned mm-hmm. Emerson and she could relate to that. Yeah. And I thought about how I tried to create an entry point for conversation. Um, Let me clearly say I'm not an evangelist, but when it comes to speaking, I try to find a place where we can agree. Mm -hmm. And Emerson is one. Plato in philosophy is another. So those are all, those are people that are non-threatening places to meet, you know, crossroads it feels to meet. And because when you say Plato, you think about philosophy, but you don't think about religion. Right. And but it, it to me, there there's a marriage, and so then the conversation begins. So I can imagine that that happened a lot where you were that week. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of rich opportunity to have conversation, and I wasn't trying to convince anybody of anything. I was there to. You know, to share and talk about new thought to anybody who is interested. And um, especially the people who are in the different new thought organizations, because I'm all about cross-connecting the people at Unity with the people at Agape, with the people at Centers for Spiritual Living, with the people at Divine Science, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the leaders and a lot of the people who are active in those um, denominations or sections of new thought were there. And it was wonderful to just be able to spend time together with them in a relatively unstructured framework. Mm -hmm. You know, when they're at at their exhibit booth, we set it up so that all the booths were open to each other. And so we had a chance to just kind of wander around and and cross-connect. And to me, that's wonderful. And if we can get somebody who's part of Unity to understand, oh, the Affiliated New Thought Network is a place where people from all over New Thought can get together, then that's a win. So, and that was... That, that was that was an unusual one because there are actually people who are real good candidates for the organization that I'm involved in to get involved in it. You know, same thing with the International New Thought Alliance. There are groups that are bringing different people together, and the more we can do that, the better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Across the aisle from us was the Swedenborgians. Wow. Yeah. And okay. they're, they're kind of new thought. They're new thought with an asterisk. Because mm-hmm. Ralph Waldo Emerson mm-hmm. was a Swedenborgian, mm-hmm. <laughs> and they claim him as one of their success stories. So, was, all right, we're sharing a lineage here, which we do in so many ways. You know, we find that we find that lineage connection in more places than people would imagine. Yep, and, and then you then argue with that kind of. <laughs> There was a wonderful presentation. I thought it was like three minutes long. It turned out it was about eight or nine minutes. Uh, It was a keynote that Marianne Williamson did. And one of the points that Mm. she made is that religion is radical. That once we have a religion, we can become radical and we can bring these ideas, the five ideas uh, of the, uh, the global ethic, into our world through our religion and be passionate and radical about it. And uh, really cool idea. And she says, you know, don't worry about the, the people who are going to be trying to beat you up because they're going to be people. She says, if you think it's bad in religion, try going into politics. <laughs> yeah, I, I was reading about her. She was going to run for president at she, one she, point. Yeah, she, she was running for the nomination last time around. Uh, didn't end the way that she wanted it to. Let's... Uh, do another break, and then we will do a prayer 
based on our awareness, understanding, and commitment to the best ideas of all the religions. Learn to put practical prayer to work in your life. The steps are simple to learn and let you begin to get real results to create the life of your dreams immediately. Reverend Bill Marcioni's widely acclaimed book, Practical Prayer for Real Results, gives you a clear summary of the new thought principles behind practical prayer and the series of easy-to-understand steps found in the most effective prayers from religions and spiritual practices all over the world and throughout history. Practical prayer is not a replacement for your religion or practice. It's a technique to make the work you do in consciousness even more effective. The book includes 40 prayers on various topics that you can adapt as needed and use as your own. Practical Prayer for Real Results is available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook on Amazon or at b-the-light.com. That's b-the-light.com. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol, here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. And we've been having a um, wonderful conversation about amazing. Yeah, yeah, the thread between all the religions of the world. And we have so much in common. And it, what we have in common is belief. We believe that there's something bigger going on. And that, by the way, includes atheists. Because to be an atheist, you have to have a framework for what it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and even that is a framework. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, let's do a prayer on the best idea of all the religions. Let's let go of the idea that whatever path that we've been on, whatever practice we've been doing is the best one ever. It is completely possible that we're right, that this is the best thing we ever have had. And it's also possible that there's an and, that there is this that I've come to understand already, this practice that I've come to be doing on a daily or hourly basis. And there's something that can be added onto it from another tradition, from another perspective, from another idea. And maybe it's the concept of service of someone who is all about serving other people. Maybe it's about bringing compassion into the world. Maybe it's about being a way shower for peace. Maybe it's about praying multiple times a day five times a day to polish our heart. Whatever that next great, grand, wonderful idea is, let us open to that new possibility. And we do that by turning away from the details in the world around us and opening to that infinite creative intelligence, that one divine presence and power that creates everything. It's God, it's spirit, it's nature, it's Allah, it is the source, it is whatever it is that we want to call it. It is that one from which everything flows. And it shows up in so many, many different ways. It individualizes and particularizes itself as each and every one of us, everyone within the sound of my voice is an expression of the divine taking his or her or its own particular form. And all of those pieces are fitting together in sweet perfection. God doesn't do any second-rate work. So if there's something that's showing up that looks different than what I'm used to, instead of saying there's something wrong with it, there's the possibility that there's something to be offered by that. Maybe I can take this new idea and incorporate it into what's true of me and allow my awareness of love to rise, to allow the light that I'm shining to brighten, to allow the way that I'm engaging in the world to be uplifted. Whatever that new possibility is, I'm now calling on that guidance to take those next steps to have the best ideas of any and all of the religions, of other practices, of people who look and seem separate or distinct from me or from each of us, to allow the good, the love, the light that they're bringing to be made visible and understandable and acceptable in a way that allows more good and more love to come into the world. So I claim now that it's not nearly so much about me as it is about us. There is a group, there is a community, there is an opportunity for this light, for this love, for this goodness to shine even more brightly through each of us individually and through all of us together. 
So that's what I'm calling on. I'm calling on this goodness to unfold in new and dramatic and wonderful and joyous ways. Pleasant and harmonious and uplifting and as good as we could have expected and even better. And I'm grateful for the wonderful ways that it's showing up. I'm grateful for the newness that is each of us. And I'm grateful to be able to speak this word and release it into that creative law that has created everything and to know with absolute certainty that it is now creating this. This good, this enlightenment, this uplift is underway now. And so I let it be. So it is. Amen. The Practical Prayer Podcast with Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence is a production of BeTheLight.com. Be-the-light.com. Where you can find more information about practical prayer for real results. Our theme is by Music of Wisdom. You can learn about the spiritual community of New Thought Philadelphia with daily guided meditations, weekly celebrations of spirit, and Reverend Bill's classes in practical spirituality at NewThoughtPhilly.org. This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description.